Hello and welcome to episode 9 of The Actual Magician. Yes, I am an actual magician. Explains where today we're going to take a look at the Diceman book and in particular how this fits into the Western esoteric industry system and particularly the way I teach it. We're also going to take a look at how the personality of a person of ourselves, of you, actually can be modelled by the tree of life. And do excuse me if this video has more cuts in than usual. I'm suffering from a terrible cold, so I'm having to practice a lot of breathing exercises to not cough everywhere today for this recording. So we're also going to take a look at an NLP model that I developed over time, and this is featured in NLP Magic. And it's basically a triangle that we make of the three fundamental things that make up our everyday personality, our everyday psyche, our everyday sense of ego, which is more of a process, an engagement, a relationship to the universe rather than an actual thing. So there really is no the self or the personality or the ego or even the shadow. All of these things are dynamic processes arising from the same field of engagement that we have whenever we are separate or perceive ourselves as separate from the universe itself because there is no the universe, there is only universe because there's nothing outside of it to give it a reference. So in this video I'm going to briefly explain about the Diceman book in particular and give you some ideas about the methodology that can be used in order to start to shake the the edges of one's personality. So the Diceman was actually first published in the US in 1971 under the name Luke Reinhardt. Now this was actually the name of the protagonist in the book, so it reads as a pretend autobiography, an autobiography based on elements of truth, and the author sets themselves out as a psychiatrist experimenting with in effect, rolling the dice in order to make decisions in their lives, only it's a little bit more complicated than that, particularly when we follow the methodology itself. The book was actually written by a professor of American literature who was born in Albany, New York, called George Cockcroft. Now, he was born in 1932, And it took him five years to write the book, which was based on an idea that he'd had when he was talking about Sartre and Nietzsche and presenting a seminar to his students on freedom. And he perhaps made an off-cuff remark about, we might as well live our lives by rolling a dice. And the reaction of his students gave him an idea, the seed of an idea for writing a book, a novel, a fictional book, on a character who decides to to live his life according to dice rolls. Now, George Cockcroft actually wrote several other books, The Adventures of Wim in 86, 1986, The Search for the Diceman, a sort of sequel, spiritual sequel to The Diceman in 1993, and a strange help book, workbook called The Book of the Die, which was produced in 2000. Now, the book didn't originally sell very well, but it did sell in Europe far more than it did in America to begin with. But by at least 2017, it had sold 2 million copies and was known as a cult classic. And George Cockcroft actually died relatively recently in 2020. And there is a interesting article in The Guardian, a long-form article, which I'll link in the comments, where you can find out more about George Cockcroft himself. 
Other uses of the dice concept were in a documentary called Dice World by Channel 4 in 1999, and also a four-season travel series that was sort of inspired by The Diceman. It was actually called The Diceman, and that ran between 1998 and 2000. And that was basically a simple idea of choosing where the travel documentary would go based on the role of a dice. So I discovered the Dice Man bug very early on in my studies. I can't remember if my second magical teacher introduced the book to me or whether I discussed it or discovered it around the same time. But it was very, very influential and I practiced it quite a lot and have gone back to various other practices based on on the book itself. Now, the actual work belongs to the neophyte, the zealotor, and to some extent the theoricus grade. Because on the tree of life, we can see that the world, the world in which we perceive and exist, apparently the apparent world around us through our sensory input and through our processing, it belongs in the path between Yisod and Malkuth, the kingdom or reality as it manifests all the way from Ketha on the Tree of Life, as we've looked at in previous videos, and Yisod, which is the self-reflective, self-contracting sense of personality as separate to existence itself. So we end up with a self-seeing eye that sees itself and that process, the recognition of that process, the coruscating light of what comes out of that, we recognize or in effect experience as self. I feel this, I see this, I hear this, I touch this, I do this, I decide that. All of these are arising out of that both contraction and separation between ourselves and the universe and as a result our sense of self our sense of being a person who we are can change over the years and can be fundamentally rewired in its experience by industry experience by experiences that can be perceived as traumatic by experiences that are important or illuminating or out of the ordinary. Now, Gurdjieff, which we'll come on to in a future video, George Gurdjieff, the developer of a system called the Fourth Way, he believed that our natural personality then generates shells almost, in effect a sort of clipothic sense of identity, through what he called buffers. And these were to somehow protect us from the constant shocks of the universe. H.P. Lovecraft, I think, described that it's a blessing that the human mind can't comprehend its relationship to the total unknowability of the entire universe. Otherwise, we'd go insane right here and now if we had one moment of experience that actually fully realized the scale of our life within the cosmos as a whole. Be that as it may, our personality does have fundamental parts of it that we can recognize in the structure. And these are the three things that we can fundamentally change. And I use the word fundamentally a lot because the word yesod in the tree of life means foundation. This is the fundament, the foundation of our very existence. It's how we experience things. It's through the process by which we experience things. Now, in NLP, it's seen that the way we interpret that process is as important as the process and the experiences that we have. A number of people could experience the same accident, the same traumatic event, such as an air plane crash where there are very few survivors and depending on how each of those people individually experience and interpret that same experience will depend on all sorts of things about them but it will also 
change the way that they then live and behave and make decisions in the future. There's a very good film about that, which I'll superimpose somewhere up here. Now, one of the things that we, we, we can take a look at is that this triangle model that we have is actually the personality. It's the basis of the personality. My second occult teacher, who I was working with around the same time as the Dice Man technique and many others, was my Zelator Theoricus phase, was uh, prone to say various things. For example, it's useless attacking someone's beliefs because a person is their belief. What a person actually is, is their belief. And so when you're attacking their beliefs or trying to argue against them, undermine them, or actually change them or get the person to change their beliefs, it's a very difficult thing because it's them. They are their belief. And it's taken me 40 or 50 years, I guess, to really fully appreciate just how wise a thing that is. The fact is, is that we I think I've developed it a little bit further. We aren't, I believe, our values in which, which uh, is the general field in which our beliefs exist, uh, in order to have a belief about capital punishment, for example, you have to have a value of life and death, otherwise there would be no possibility of holding any belief about capital punishment or things to do with the value of life and death, whether you believed in animal experimentation or something like that. All of these beliefs that we have that make us us are in effect part of our values. They exist within the field of values. Also, we have our sense of time. And I think time is a fundamental sense that we have that can change the way we experience the world. We can access that through meditation, through dream work, through ritual, through all sorts of other things to experience, and divination as well, to experience a different nature of what time actually is. So those are two of the three parts of the triangle at least. But we're going to particularly concentrate today on values and beliefs, particularly beliefs, because this is what the Dice Man book really goes for. Within the Dice Man book itself, it defines what the methodology is. When uh, the Luke Reinhardt character talks to another doctor, Dr. Weinberger, and he says to him, we have to begin in the most trivial ways in order to overcome initial resistance. The psychotic has no areas free to be spontaneous and original. The neurotic has few, normal, healthy. Persons like yourselves have only a small handful. All other areas are controlled by the dictatorship of personality. It's the job of dice therapy, like the job of revolution in the world as a whole, to enlarge free territory. We work first in areas where there's not much threat to the normal personality. Once the patient's got the grand rules and got into the spirit of playfulness, we expand the dice decisions into other areas. And he goes on to say, We also show them how to use the dice as a veto. Every time they do something, we ask them to shake a die, and if it comes up a six, they can't do it. They have to ask the die to choose something else for them. Vetoes are a great method, but hard. Most of us go through our lives from one thing to the next mechanically without thought. In theory, we're working towards the purely random man, one without habit or pattern, eating from zero to six or seven times a day, sleeping haphazardly, and so forth. So, in effect, the Dice Man book is a very simple method. All we're doing is we're rolling a dice to determine what we do but it is still within our control to choose the parameters of the dice rolls. And this is where the art and science of, of the dice technique really comes in. In effect as well, the veto method is something similar to a method by Crowley where 
people were encouraged to actually mark their arms every time they engaged in a habitual thing. The Gurdjieff methods have very similar things where we try and break and stop our habitual patterns so that we can really understand that we are in far more control of what we're doing than merely habitual patterns. And this is a good technique to tie in with our NLP work. Sometimes I get students to practice a method of pivot grammar where we actually pivot words. For example, my name is Marcus Katz would be my my name name is is Marcus Marcus Katz Katz is a replication, a duplication of each word. But then we pivot those words so we get my name, name my, is Marcus, Marcus is, cats, cats. And we always double the word if it ends in, if the sentence has an odd number of words. And I ask people to introduce themselves in the uh, workshop using pivot grammar as to how they got there. So, for example, I might say, my name, name my, is Marcus, Marcus is, cats, cats. I travel, traveled I, here today, today here, by train, train by. And when you practice this method a lot, you can actually begin to formulate your sentences more constructively and deliberately because you are embedding a minute delay in between the automatic or autonomic processes. It's as easy as that. So what we're doing with this method and with the DICE method is trying to break the habitual pattern. And on the Tree of Life, this is seen as the moon card coming down from Hod, the reverberation, the echo on the Tree of Life underneath the veil that forms the final bind of the personality structure. And the moon path is one of the unconscious. It's one of habits of fear of wanting to stay in the same cycle time and time again. And as that feeds down on the other pillar, we actually have Netzach and we have the path of the last judgment, making decisions, making a judgment, dividing things, separating things, structuring things from the force of the other pillar, we have to form on the other side. But as well as structuring things, we're also trying to break structures down. It's not just that the mind is a pattern-making device, it's also a pattern-breaking device. And we're deliberately utilising that pattern-breaking method in doing these things. So, the Dice Man technique then, and there are methods in the book of the die as well i didn't use this originally i this came along later on in my life so i was just developing methods based on the book the original book itself one way of doing this to begin to change yourself is to begin with very small things minor decisions and it could be as simple as cleaning the house or the hoovering, doing the dishes, something domestic and relatively trivial, something where there's no big consequence for doing or not doing it today. And for those who study my NLP work, you'll notice here we're also looking at values. This is like the value hierarchy. We're actually building that into the parameters and the way it person chooses the parameters for the list that they make for the dice. So what we're doing here is we might have one thing that is radical, relatively radical, to the activity that we may or may not choose to do today. So for example, instead of cleaning, I might choose something positive as my current belief system and values have it, of going for a walk. And I would put that as number one or number six. So the radical thing is one or six on the dice, just for ease of patterning it out. 
the dice may choose against that at some later date. So you have that radical thing and then have maybe two in a sort of mini bell curve within the dice roll itself, maybe uh, number three and number four are do the dishes as is and then make a minor change. So you're still doing the, the, the activity, but you're going to change it. So number two would be do the dishes whilst listening to music, and number six would be do the dishes in absolute silence. So you can go for a walk and not do the dishes. You can do the dishes, more chance of that than anything else, or you can do the dishes... Um, listening to something or not listening to something or you can just do the dishes so when we set the parameters in this way we're not quite disturbing our equilibrium but we are beginning to outsource our behavior to randomness or to chance or to a pre-existent pattern depending on what your belief is within your value system and yourself, because that makes who you are. Do you believe it's random? Do you believe it's defined? Do you believe it's preordained? How do you believe in terms of your free will? And one of the important things that we are doing here is really working with the Theoricus and the Zelator grades on the Tree of Life in order to make that solution and calcination, as we looked at in the alchemy video, really active in our life. We're both breaking down and working. We're being prompted to do things that we might not usually do. So it's a really good method for the Theoricus, uh, the beginning bit of a the Theoricus grade, the later bit of the Zelator grade, it can be done within that, and it can be done, as we've seen, give not calcina uh, calcination, it can be used within any of the other grades as well, because we're then reverting back to a lower level of our interaction with the universe in order to shift it, change it, break it up, recalibrate it, and so forth. So as you then work with a few simple things, you can then start to add a few more complicated things into the method itself. In the actual book, the character chooses, for example, to, I think, choose a day or a week to be Christ, to actually live as Jesus would. And he has some interesting um, he has some interesting experiences as a result of doing that and some insights into his view about other people, himself, and relationships. And this brings us, I guess, to one of the important things in the book, which is there's a lot of sex in this book, there is a lot of experimental living, and there are some potentially problematic scenes and events in it that are sort of explained or hand-waved away slightly by the narrative device. So be prepared for that going into the book. But it became a cult classic for a reason. A lot of people, including Richard Branson, apparently used to book bands when he was a record label based on the throw of a dice inspired by this book. So expand little things. Now, one of the things I found quite useful was, for example, interests and hobbies. And for one example, I spent a whole month being a country and Western fan. And that was completely opposite to the type of music I'd usually listen, listen to. And I set up set of parameters on a dice roll of one to six. Obviously, you can use the sets of dice one to ten, d twenty. If you're a, a Dungeons and Dragons or role player, um, you can use all sorts of dice and all sorts of structures for this method. But using one to six really narrows it down. It helps you define the parameters quite quite well. So I chose something like I'd listen to my usual music on a one 
or I would investigate other bands within that genre on a two and three. If it was a four or a five, I would do something totally different. If it was a six, an iPod, I will become a country and western aficionado, a fan, a really hardcore fan of country and western for number six. And that day I rolled a six. And so for a month, I had to become a country and western fan. And so I ended up listening to lots of different sorts of music, doing lots of different sorts of things, reading lots of different sorts of magazines at the time um, than I would have done usually. And I met some interesting people as a result of that. But also, more importantly, it then changed my personality. And here's the thing about changing yourself. Because we are not a thing, an object, a noun, we are a process, process is we, then we're more like a graph that is changing, uh, like an oscilloscope, a sound wave. We are a measure, our personality, who we are is a measure of the wave of our existence. And as a result, when you bend the wave or retune it with a tuning fork to a totally different frequency, it pulls the wave up, a bit like catastrophe theory that we'll take a look at in a little bit more detail in a future video and have referenced in a previous video. One of the things is that we pull our shape out of shape and then a bit like in Kate Bush's Elastic Girl rubber band song, we then spring back into shape when we let go of that behavior, that artificial behavior, that imposed behavior, that dice random chaotic behavior, but we don't return to quite the same oscilloscope shape. We've fundamentally been shifted and we can't undo that, that pull or that push or that variation in who we usually are. Alice Crowley, for example, was said to, at one point, I think he might reference this in Confessions, wear a ring on a different finger, depending on who he wanted to be that day. I actually used that method in a opportunity where I was joining a new place of work, and I thought, these people don't know me, they have no idea who I am other than the interview, so I created five totally, uh, totally, uh, slightly, five slightly different personality structures and I rolled a dice for who I'd be that week. And I then wore a finger on, I, wore, I then wore a ring on, uh, I can't remember which finger, for that particular week. And that week, I was all sorts of things, but one of those things was clumsy. So I was deliberately knocking into things or dropping things or all sorts of other clumsy behaviors. The second week, I rolled the dice again, and I didn't get that personality. I got a totally different one. And that personality wasn't clumsy. Now, I'd totally forgotten that. It wasn't mentioned in the list, the parameters that I'd made for rolling a number two. It just happened to be a different character whose clumsiness was neither here nor there. And so I went into the workplace the second week as a slightly different character. And one of the fascinating things that I noticed was when I reached out for something, someone would almost move it out of the way. And I'd then reach it. It was almost like when you're a child and you're going through a rapid growth spurt and you sort of keep knocking things over because your body's changed in the intervening weeks since you last picked a particular thing or did a particular activity. And so you're very, what's the word, um, gainly and, and um, gawky and, and stuff like that. But in this case, it was over a week. But the other people had calibrated themselves to my apparent self, to my apparent personality as it was presented to them. And as a result, their behavior had changed. And so when I changed my behavior, the second week as a totally different personality based on the dice man, 
their behavior had to change. And in some cases, it was notable. In some cases, it, it, you could see that there was confusion. They weren't quite sure why they were confused, but they were confused. And this is one of the processes of self-change work that's very important, that the self is a mechanism and the ego is a mechanism to maintain consistency, to maintain safety, to maintain cohesiveness and comprehensiveness. It has to understand what's going on on some foundation in order for behavior and existence to actually manifest within, through, and around it. And so as a result, it's always in relationship to that. And this is why a lot of us are fairly averse to change. We are also, as a species, very loss-averse, which then explains a lot of addictive behaviors such as gambling or drinking or all sorts of other addictive behaviors where we would prefer to keep gaining the apparent gains that we're getting rather than lose anything even though logically there's no possibility that our life is going to get any better and so as a result when we are doing self-change work we are also impacting the people around us whose ego processes and whose self-identity and so forth is also making that model in real time as well. And as a result, we have to guide ourselves through this sort of existence. There's an interesting book, actually, that's just come to mind, A Splendid Chaos by John Sheckley, I think. I'll... I'll, I'll put it up here, Splendid Chaos, where a whole group of random people are transported to a strange place, a planet perhaps, an alternate plane of existence that is absolutely chaotic. And so from moment to moment, it's very difficult to know what to do or how to react or what you're being expected to do. And of course, it's a great shock to a lot of the people who end up on this particular planet, but others sort of thrive by existing to the moment to moment and it's, it's a very interesting book um, it's full of some shocking scenes because it's a splendid chaos but it's very very interesting in terms of how a self would actually be able to generate itself in an ongoing basis in a chaotic environment so what we do then is using the dice man technique and rolling a dice, beginning with small and trivial things and building up aspects of our personality. You can also combine this with a book that I've referenced, I think, in episode one of the book series of Prometheus Rising by Robert Anton Wilson. You can combine the dice man technique with Prometheus Rising as well and some of the exercises in that to really choose a different personality each day, each week, or modify a slight bit of your personality. Choose what your interest may be. Choose what you do for an hour and so forth. You can use this to make these little shocks to your system and become aware of your own what Gurdjieff called kunda buffers or, or buffers in your personality structure. And one of the important things that we do with the year of waiting in the zealotor phase in the Western Esoteric and History system is we give exercises that are in part to orientate the student to time, space, self and relationship to the universe, Libra Resh, the Vanishing Ritual, the Middle Pillar and the Rose Cross. And also add in the hexagram ritual, I guess, to to that set. Um, but I tend to use that for more theoricus work. There is a period of trying to do all of these new things that appear to have no material benefit, no immediate response necessarily, unless you're 
you're naturally good at doing them and evoking the sense of protection with a banishing ritual to begin with the moment you first start it. But in part, it's to show the candidate, show the neophyte, the zealot, or in this case, that their life is constrained by lots of things, that they are not necessarily perfectly free to choose to do these new behaviours regularly every single day over a period of time because there are lots of other things going on in their life. And so it's a experiential encountering of the buffers and the boundaries that we exist within, within our self-processing of the universe that we're interesting that we are interested in awakening in the student so that they can get a sense of the world that is between their Yisod and their Malkuth, supported by the decisions and the judgments they're trying to make on the last judgment path and the habitual patterns and the constraints we have in the world around us that are on the moon path as well, illustrated by the moon. So we have this idea of Kesheth the bow, really being pulled back by techniques such as the dice man. So that's the dice man technique and a look at some of the ways it can be used to deconstruct and examine the personality and the formulation, structure, patterning, constraints and freedoms of the personality as an experience, as a verb rather than a noun. It is not the personality, it is personality arising from engagement with world, universe around us through a process of self-constraint, self-contraction and also from separation, from an illusionary separation that we have with the universe. And the Dice Man is a great technique for really ex beginning to examine that. It's sort of like putting the crampons in on the mountain phase at the lower levels of the mountain in order to begin a higher ascent. The other two books that I've got here, and there's also um, something called the Book of Wim and a few other books, um, not necessarily as related to the original dice technique itself. Uh, the Search for the Dice Man, which is, again, I think it is perhaps not as good as the first book, and but it's got some interesting ideas in, and you can see where the author is going with it a little bit more in that. And then this rather chaotic, interesting book full of plays, full of poetry, full of dialogue, full of sections from fictional books and even fictional Bible extracts and so forth. And But it's got some very interesting things in it, and this is perhaps a book that I come back to a little bit more often than the original uh, Dice Man book itself. I tend to refer to some things in here that I might not have thought about or, or come across that are now more meaningful with a bit of experience behind me. So perhaps I'd go for the Dice Man book and the Book of the Die as a pair and read the others if, if you're interested in those. So in the next video, I'm hoping to do a video on the importance of keeping a magical journal, for which I've got some footage I'd like to share with you from my own magical journals from the age of 13 onwards. So they're going back over 40 years now, over 40 years now. And why I think it's very important to have a magical journal and to practice consistently as well. And some tricks you can do later on, maybe 10 years, 20, 30 years down the line of your magical work in order to really leverage the work that may seem arduous, repetitive, annoying, pointless in your first steps on the magical path. This work will never let you waste anything because the universe itself doesn't waste anything. So we're going to take a look at that in episode 10, I think it will be, next week.
So in the meantime, I'd like to thank you for engaging with this video. And as ever, the worker is hidden in the workshop.